Have you got a name for the podcast? No. You don't have a name? This is actually a good way to begin. Yeah, this is a good way to begin, actually. So I'm here with Alex Arnaud, who is one of the first few fans of the channel and a fellow content creator out of the UK. He is a student at Lancaster University, majoring in film and philosophy, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, philosophy and film, exactly. Philosophy and film. Uh, so welcome to the channel. Thank you. I'm yeah. excited. Can I say the setup's crazy? I, I, never mean, thought, I never thought for such a small channel, it looks something like this. It's kind of mad. <laughs> well, you were the one that helped me uh, set it up. Yeah. I'm not an audio guy, so I'm glad that Alex here is a, a musician who's uh, been on Spotify. Can you tell me a little bit more about your music? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, I finished, uh, I finished high school. And uh, after high school, I decided to take a gap year. Uh, of which I moved out to France and I decided to focus on film and music. Uh, so I was quite fortunate. I managed to work on a professional film uh, that took me to Cannes, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, made an album, went to LA, met with producers. And so I've got an album that's going to be coming out periodically very soon. I think the first song is set to come out in eight weeks. I need to double check that. Six okay. to eight weeks. Um, but yeah, pretty much. So hopefully get a career started in that. And at the same time, back it up with some... Uh, some substance at university, you know, not to scare the parents. But that's how <laughs> right, it goes. right. Yeah, you know, a lot of uh, Gen Z is all, they all want to be content creators and yeah, influencers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, you know, a poll came out saying that, like, I don't know, something like 80% of young people just want to be uh, influencers. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a little sad. Yeah. I mean, when you want to, I think when you want to get into the business, and this is one thing I found, when you get into the business for the fame aspect rather than the creation aspect, um, you'll never make it. It's impossible. Yeah. It's literally impossible. You can't do it. So yeah. So yeah, pretty much. I yeah. mean, so what drives you? What makes you get up in the morning? Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, your project in Can. Yeah. Um, do you mean in general what wakes me up in the morning or oh, just whatever? Okay. Um, I don't know. I'm just. I guess I'm still young. I think we got. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I don't know. Life is like millennial Gen Z, <laughs> literally. Um, and uh, I think I just. Um, I don't know. I just. I'm excited to wake up every morning. I just. I've got so much to do. Um, from like you know making music to then uh, working on a film. I'm working on a documentary and a film also at okay. the moment. Tell me more about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I can't say too much. Actually. Sure. Uh, sure. I'm not. Uh, I'm not allowed to actually. <laughs> okay. um, but broad strokes. Broad strokes. I'm making a documentary uh, that's going to be set in Kenya. Okay. And it's uh, the thing is, uh, well, the pitch is a call to action. So it's about. Uh, it's following the story of. Um, a person who wants to create a charity in the slum of Kenya. And at the same time, we follow the story of four people in Kenya of different areas, uh, different areas, different ages and different backgrounds and sort of how they all intertwine. And it's meant to be more like a docu film that interests people instead of asking them to donate. Right. Um, and then if they can donate to this charity that I'm working with, uh, that the film is going to be hopefully supporting, uh, then that's fantastic. The goal is to raise a million. So if we can raise a million dollars or pounds or whatever. Euros, well, you hear that we YouTube get. audience. Uh, <laughs> once this documentary comes out, let's help the fine people of Kenya. There we go. Yeah, the fine people of Kenya. I've been there, so it was really fantastic. And it was an incredible experience. Um, I could talk for hours on this. So sure, I'll leave yeah, it behind. I mean, uh, if not, I'm doing another film on my own production company, which is soon going to be set up. Um, with a friend of mine who's a producer and uh, is a fantastic DP. Uh, so for everyone who doesn't know that, that is a, um, a cinematographer, basically. Okay. D- director of photography. And uh, he's a fantastic DP. He called me, said, I need a script. And I said, Nate, I've got the perfect script for you. <laughs> so I can't talk about the script. But, of course. Um, but yeah, it should be coming out and hopefully it will uh, win a few prizes. It very much questions the ideas of our society and especially my generation. And hopefully we'll move cinema into a new age. So and this is, this, <laughs> I mean, this is a perfect segue. Uh, you know, one of the things that I that made me get into YouTubing uh, was, you know, I watched a bunch of The Critical Drinker, The Nerd Rotic, mm. Geeks and Gamers, yeah. uh, you know, all this stuff that rose up out of, basically, they all got famous off of two things, Captain Marvel 
and the new Star Wars trilogy, yeah, which yeah. was absolute shite. So I actually haven't watched either of them because I saw the reviews and I just didn't want to <laughs> after seeing you, the you, So you haven't seen Star Wars 7, 8, and 9? Um, no, I don't think so. I watched the, the first one, I think, about Ren. Yeah. It was okay. It was not too bad. I think it was cool to have a female protagonist. That was quite fun right. to change the story. Um, but I haven't watched the, the next ones. Well, and about so... the female protagonist, it, she completely skipped the, you know, hero's journey. That's, so that's, I think, like, I do want to preface, since I am young and I don't want to get cancelled, I am all for sort of bringing diversity into casts and crews. Sure, so am and I. having more protagonists that are female is, I think, a fantastic thing. However, I think there's this sort of cheap and lazy writing that's starting to appear in that's cinema. It. Where, I mean, I, I haven't watched Captain Marvel, so I can't comment too much. But from what I've heard... You're not missing much. Is, yeah, <laughs> the protagonist doesn't She's automatically overcome, awesome she at everything. That's the problem. She doesn't overcome any barriers. And it's to push this message that women are incredible, which they are. Sure. But what makes women incredible is that they go over these barriers as they grow up. And there's right. so much things that and they women evolve. Are, yeah. And there's so much things that women are oppressed by. Right. However, these films aren't showing that. And I think that's right. what's the incredible thing about being a woman and why we respect women so much, right? I do, and I'm sure you do yeah, too. Yeah, of course. And um, they're not showing that. And they kind of overcome this, which also kind of takes away from the story of film. Like, yeah. If you have no barriers, you've got no climax and no sort of... Well, no rising action. No nothing. rising it's action the, the whole thing is um, flat. So that's what I've heard has been coming out of these films. Um, it's the same thing as like a female James Bond. It's like, I don't mind it, but it's kind of lazy. It's like, why not make a separate film... A whole thing that's completely a incredible. A whole series that's like not even parallel to James Bond is a complete different thing. Maybe MI7 or MI10. And follow sort of how female protagonists become secret agents in the real world. And it's like, I think that'd be so much more interesting than just having a female Bond. It's lazy. The gender and race swapping is, is pretty lazy. That being mm. said, uh, you know, it's been long rumored and I think he's about to age out. I would have loved to have seen Idris Elba oh, as J- I <laughs> double seven. I, I mean, love that guy. I mean, coming from London as well, like he's a fellow Londoner. I'd love to. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'd be I mean, it's, it's, like, yeah, I'd be excited. But I think he's a bit old. I don't. Th- I don't he think he'll make to it. Age out. Yeah. Unfortunately, he won't make it. Yeah, but you, you can't. You can't have everything. So, so what do you think the uh, the major problems are in Hollywood today versus 10, 20, 30 years ago of whatever you, films you've seen? back in the day I, I think there's been an oppression certainly on writers i think that's the big thing to sort of follow a certain agenda and conform to political norms that we have nowadays and the goal of film is, was to challenge those things originally i right. mean when when you had film first come out with the lumiere brothers um mm-hmm. they didn't want to add sound to film and then sound slowly got added to it and they were right. like no that's not this is just meant to be a moving picture and yeah. it's like Film was always about challenging those boundaries and then eventually it became a form of storytelling. Right. And stories in every sit- which way are meant to challenge sort of society, add new things to it. And it's like 1984 is a great example. I mean, the Soviets probably hated that book. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But that's, that's the whole point. It's like stories are meant to be told, whether they're good or bad, whether they're um, sort of sexist or racist, because then we can learn from those stories and see what people right. like at the time. Um, And the problem is now is I think Snow White's great example, the new film that's coming out. And the (laughs) controversy with that, it's like, (laughs) I don't mind it. I think it's cool that we have a black protagonist playing in a Disney film. But the problem is, is it's Snow White, if that makes sense. (laughs) Right. And as I said, the same thing with the Bond film, why not make a new female protagonist that is black that could have a fantastic story? And it just seems like a cop out and like lazy writing. And that controversy will just lead to less box office tickets and I don't know. I don't. Th- I don't think it's a good idea. And so it. Ha- I mean, it hasn't worked. It hasn't. You know, worked. I, I actually. I snuck into. Thank God, I didn't even pay for it. I snuck into the, see the, the Little Mermaid remake. Oh, yeah? And first of all, the original is eighty three minutes long. This thing was two hours and ten minutes. So automatically, they're just adding filler. Yeah. And it's just like, why? <laughs> I mean, you know. I so this is a funny story. Um, I mean, I, I really, honestly, at the end of the day, it doesn't bother me too much. I don't care that much. I think it's right. a shame, but I don't care. But I can see people who do care. And my girlfriend's ginger, right? right. Uh, re- that and means when, redhead for the American that viewers. That means redhead, right? <laughs> and um, when that film came out, she was, when I say horrified, she's like, look, I'd love to have a black person play it. 
But this was my princess when I was growing up. I, I was like, you know, I was bullied for being ginger and I saw myself through the princess. And now this film's coming out. I was awaiting this film and now she's no longer properly ginger. And it's like, you know, what the hell's happening? Right. And she felt like she was sort of being taken over by this agenda that's being pushed by Hollywood and that her own self and her own identity is now being challenged and like it's not worth it. Right. Especially when her as a ginger, I mean, the stuff they say in, like, in France, so she's French. Um, we would just say gingers have no souls. They say they say <laughs> stuff way worse than that. <laughs> Terrible stuff. And she grew up like hearing all of that. And so having that film come out, I mean, she refused to watch it. And it's like, I think it takes away. It's the same way that if we had a film about, I don't know, Obama. I mean, I'm sure you've seen the memes. And sure, it was yeah. white Obama. Personally, Played I'd, by Matt Damon. Yeah, I'd be pissed <laughs> for the fucking... Uh, I'd be pissed for the, you know, the minorities and the African-American community. Exactly. In the US. I'd yeah. be pissed for them. I'd be like, what, what's, what's happening? Right. Um, especially that that was... I like mean, Rosa Parks played by Lee Bra- uh, Brie yeah, Larson. It's ridiculous. It, not only is it... I find it personally disrespectful to the history. 100%. But um, also, I'm sure loads of kids, especially black kids, who saw themselves probably wanting to become president through Obama and now seeing a white person play that on screen... I think that's just hugely disrespectful. And I think right. it takes away from their dreams. So, um, the, the, I, I, honestly, I think the, that the industry hasn't uh, gone into any of the rich, rich history, uh, African history, Latin American history. <laughs> that's really interesting. Uh, hey, before even the Spaniards got to Latin America, what about yeah. the Incans? Uh, you know, you had a, a movie like Apocalypto by uh, Mel Gibson. But that only scratches the surface. Well, also, in general, the other thing is a lot of these American films are from the American perspective, right. which I find really interesting. And so when I, I, when I went to Kenya, I saw a few Kenyan films. Right. Um, and seeing <clears throat> the world from sort of a filmmaker from Africa's perspective or Kenya's perspective, um, you see other sort of filmmakers like uh, Luca Guadagnino, who did Call Me By Your Name and all of that sort of the way he sees Italy and the way, and it's so different from the American yeah. perspective. And the way he portrayed Americans was really quite funny. It's almost like a disrespect that they have towards Americans too loud and all of this. And so um, it's, it's really interesting. And the Americans have such a focus on giving the American perspective. And so when you're making a white Obama, <laughs> there's a big problem there, right. you know what I mean? So, right. and I get what they're trying to do. I get all the inclus- inclusivity thing and it's important. It's very why, important. Why, why not tap the origin? But this is it. The original yeah. stuff. And it, it is very important to re- represent minorities. But um, in this way, I think it's just a little cheap and a bit lazy. Right. That's the problem. And I think actually it almost the fact that Snow White and The Little Mermaid caused so much controversy, it almost, I wouldn't say it's a disrespect, but it takes away from these African-American communities and almost makes it into a joke and something that's marketable. Right. instead of something that's actually true and like really presents a great story. Right. right. It's almost using, it's almost like they're being used again. It's, it's almost racist to use them like that to be able to market the film better. Right. So I don't know. I don't I mean, there, like there it. was, uh, I, I didn't, I don't think I saw it, but uh, maybe you have, it came out in like 2002, The Princess and the Frog. That was... So that's a great Disney film. I love that Disney film. Okay. I mean, it's tell great. me more about that because I haven't seen it. And it's it's predominantly African-American cast. Yeah. So I... I mean, I watched this when I was so much younger. So I can't really remember. But what I can say is there's, they had a lot from... If I remember correctly, they had a lot of sort of um, jazz music. And I think it was influenced from... Where did the blues start again? Was it I mean, in, it's the Deep South. Yeah, the Deep South, right? We'll say... But there's a certain place where it started from, but... They had a lot of those, a lot of that music in the film. And I think it was a great representation of getting into the world of minorities for young people. Yeah. At least I haven't watched it since, so I really can't say any more on it, frankly. Right. But um, a film like that's great. Then there's people who say like the fact that the, the female protagonist kisses a frog is a bit messed up. So I was like, okay, fine. And apparently there's some racist things that happen in the film, but... It's been too long. No, I mean, she, I, she I kisses the frog and then the frog becomes a prince. Is prince, that, is... yeah. But I think it's the fact that she kisses a frog, that a black person, that a black person is meant to kiss I mean, a frog. Wasn't, wasn't there like something longer ago? Because like, I mean, the, the whole frog kissing thing has been around for as long as I can remember. Like even before yeah. this movie. Well, I don't know. I mean, if people say French people kiss frogs and I'm well. French, so <laughs> I feel personally <laughs> right. attacked. But. I mean, a lot, a lot of women say, oh, well, you have to kiss a lot of frogs before you find your prince. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. There is that saying. Right. So maybe it's that. But anyways, I can't comment too much on it. But I, from what I remember, it's actually one of my favorite Disney films from when I was 
younger um because we used to play it in the cassettes you know for the cassettes right yeah 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 <laughs> so we had like snow white and seven dwarves so gen z actually remembers vhs tapes and i remember dvds well and- dvds they were around for what like two 98 yeah, to but, like but now now like it's i mean what, so what, once once the ps3 came out uh where they like sony really pushed blu-ray like it's over yeah yeah yeah. I mean, and there's just, there's something to be said about physical media. I don't have space for it in my apartment in New York, yeah, so I, honestly, I just keep it all digital. DVDs are so dumb now. It'd be, <laughs> right. it'd be really stupid to like. I mean, it's DVDs. it's it's all it's like a nostalgic thing. It's oh, I want to look at yeah. the box or whatever. But for me, it's like there's no point. I was so young, I can't even remember. But the VHS tapes were really cool, and then there was also the um, the box TV. See, yeah. people who are now like born like past 2009. So I was born in 2003. Um, will not have ever known that, but I remember having a massive TV that was like a massive box. Yeah, and now we're just all used to flat screen. If you don't have a flat screen, you're a nobody now. So it's like right. I mean, I don't think even think they make these tube TVs anymore. They don't. I don't think you can buy them online. So yeah, but so, which is a shame because if you want to play uh, retro video games, you've got to you're screwed. Yeah. You've got to <laughs> do all sorts of mumbo jumbo to yeah. you know your HDMI port to to make it work. Mm. But yeah. Uh, cinema has involved and the way we consume it also has involved That's yeah i mean thing. uh so this is this is great because like you have you had cassettes dvds blu-ray and then netflix came along and just blew everything away yeah yeah and now netflix has taken over and prime and all these streaming shows um now do you think that uh we i mean i think it's per- pretty widely i don't know how it is in the uk but we we have basically so many streaming services that it's essentially turned back into cable TV. So, you, you, you know, you can't have like five or six services. Yeah, you know, to, I see what you mean. So you basically just have one service like Netflix or Prime or whatever. And you just right, well, no, no, no. So back in the day, it was like you pay X amount of money for 200 channels and it was all like one company. And let's say it was $100. Now, in order to get the same amount of content... You have to subscribe to Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, I see what you mean, but there's so much stuff on Netflix. I don't know about you, but to watch everything that's on Netflix is pretty tough. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, what I find about there's there's two weak points that I find about Netflix, uh, and we were talking about this uh, the other day, is that they tend to cancel great shows within the first or second season. So it's like you can't get invested in it. Yeah, I think um, I think you may have mentioned this yesterday, but The Messiah got canceled, didn't it, for some yeah, sort of... Yeah, um, and that was one season. Phenomenal show. Ends on a cliffhanger. I have no idea. You know, you know it's, it's left up to the interpretation of, of the viewer. You know, and that that's that's really disrespectful to the audience. Well, that, I think the the main point is is knowing what film is, if is is or cinema, and the difference between cinema and content. And it's like, right. what is cinema? Is cinema meant to be art? Because art is an interpretation, and art should never, never be um, blocked to any audiences. Right. And you shouldn't stop it; it should keep going. Like, imagine you know when Hitler started destroying the Picassos and everything. I mean, that's a crime. You shouldn't be doing right. that. Art should be accessible to everyone. And also should be pushed forward. Um, if you just see it as content, though, then yeah, it's got a right to be blocked. So it depends what you see film as nowadays and what you see cinema as. Right. But there's, there's also the difference between cinema and YouTube videos, whatever. Um, you know, tell me more about how Gen Z consumes content. <laughs> content and cinema. Uh, is because you know this, this, you're the TikTok generation, yeah, uh, which which is I mean, it, it, <laughs> well, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, no, but it's true though. It's, it's true. you know, it's unfortunately you've, true. You've got like the attention span of a goldfish. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, are younger people going to the movies, or is it a problem that movies have been bad, or it's a problem of the audience is not going there? I think it's both. Uh, I think it's both. I think movies, it's it's harsh to say that movies have got bad because there's a lot of like um, independent production companies which are putting out incredible films that just aren't right. getting pushed forward or marketed correctly. Right. Um, 
But we're also in an age where content, especially with like TikTok, has ruined our attention span and where stories are trying to get fit into a 15 second to 30 second time frame. And so even like YouTube videos now are too long for people at my age. It's like uh, 10 minutes, that's a bit long. Let's put it on 1.5 speed. Um, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, even I do that. So I don't have TikTok. I deleted it because I knew it was like, it started, I realized it was a pure addiction. Uh, but I still watch YouTube on 1.5 speed. I don't, I can't be asked to watch something that slowly. And I still love watching films. Um, but it, yeah, I don't know. It, it's changed. It's really changed. Um, I think young people still go to the film, movies, uh, go to watch, uh, to the cinema. Sure. Um, and, um, but really, I think it's only for the big blockbusters, unfortunately, nowadays. Right. Because they need to be big and grandiose for, I think, young people to watch them. I'm not speaking for everyone because I know a lot of people who still love watching independent films getting in uh, to that scene. But it just doesn't exist as much anymore. And I think TikTok and short form content has absorbed everyone's mind now. And I think even old people, I see that with my mum. My mum's now on Instagram and she's on reels and she <laughs> sends me reels and I'm like, Shh, you know, <laughs> shit, man. <laughs> like, well, back when, what's happened? When, uh, when I got on Facebook, Facebook, I, Facebook, I don't know if anybody knows, started as like just a college thing. You have to have yeah, like yeah, you yeah. logged in with your college account. Uh, you know, I, my school was one of the first few schools that got Facebook and, you know, eventually it kind of blew up into this thing. And people's parents started getting on. So it's like once your parents start getting on, <laughs> ye, like that, the popularity of Facebook goes way down. Yeah. But, but now the par if parents are getting into Instagram, do you think that that's going to go down in popularity? No, because Instagram's no longer a social media platform. Tell it, me more about that. So, I mean, this is my opinion, but the reason like, on Facebook, for example, you wouldn't just go and follow Kim Kardashian. Do you know what I mean? That mm -hmm. didn't happen. And you wouldn't go follow your favorite sports stars. Now it's a place not just to be, well, it's, I wouldn't even say it's to be social anymore. Um, but it's not just a social media sort of outlet. It is also a marketing outlet, somewhere you can mm -hmm. start a business and it's a way to push your content forwards. It's, it, Instagram has become more of a business thing and a social thing than just a social media thing. And you know that because you're basically seeing parents on there. You've got Kevin Hart, Dave Chappelle, all these comedians, all the mm -hmm. sports stars. They're over 30, and yet I still follow them. You know, it's become, sure. it's become more than just a social media pl platform that's hipster for college students, for young people. <laughs> it, it's no longer that. And now it's even moved into like short form content. So it's not even pictures anymore. And it's trying to, I think, envelop everything and try to get everything and it's basically become the industry now it's become the film industry the music industry the marketing industry it's become everything right i mean well you have the rise of amazon studios which i think put I out a... so cool really I love you amazon think studios man all the, i feel like a lot of the stuff i mean they put I, out i'm, I'm having trouble remembering what, what movies they've put out but i, I know I've, I've seen a so lot a lot of them they put sound of metal i don't know if you watched that film no oh man so good i watched that maybe like two weeks ago for the first time that's an incredible film um the story is just like so captivating. Uh, they got another film on there, which is one of my favorites uh, called Beautiful Boy about drug addiction. Oh, that's Amazon Studios. That's Amazon Studios. Yeah, because you I remember you told me about that and I was like, yeah, I know you're a big Timothy Chalamet fan. So, I'm not, I'm not, so no, no, no. So, so you say this. I'm not a Chalamet fan, <laughs> but my some of my favorite films have him in it. And I think mm. he's played one of them. So Beautiful Boy and Call Me By Your Name are two films that I watched which I found really, really incredible and very beautiful. And he plays in them. I still think he's a great actor. And the proof is in the pudding. This guy's everywhere now. So, you know, like, <laughs> right, right. so I think he's a good actor. Uh, some people don't, but yeah, anyways. Um, but yeah, they've made some pretty damn good films. I haven't watched so much of that. They made, um, they made a really good series, which I watched ages ago with um, John Krasinski. What's it called? Oh, uh, oh my God. That, that's totally Ryan or something? Uh, Jack Ryan. Jack Ryan. I thought that was pretty cool. I mean, but to me, that was more like almost Netflix could have done that. But stuff like Sound of Metal, I think that even got like nominated for an Oscar mm -hmm. for Best Picture. Amazing film. Amazing yeah. film. I mean, uh, Apple is actually putting out a lot of... So in my opinion, like streaming service wise, I think Apple has the highest quality, very small content library. But very high quality. So you had shows like That's the, best. the Morning Show. One of my favorite favorite shows is uh, For All Mankind. Uh, I forget what what other shows um, I, I I was watching, but they just put out uh, the movie The Boys in the Boat, yeah, great which film, which was great a great film. film. 
Great film. Um, well, I think that that speaks for kind of everything. When you just try to throw money at things, like what Marvel's been doing. Right. It, it always, well, you grew up with Marvel. Yeah. You know, the Iron Man came out. But those were great anyway. films. Yeah. Now they're shit, really. I yeah, mean, like, yeah. Endgame was good. The way they right. finished that. But after Endgame. After that, everything's just gone downhill. And uh, it's, it's sad because, like, I mean, like, the actors, it's bad to say. Um, you know, it's not like they're going to be listening anyways. But <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, but, maybe, maybe Brie Larson uh, might find me on YouTube. Who knows? Yeah, hang on. Um, but, um, yeah. Um, yeah, Marvel. Yeah, I don't know. I think, sorry, as I was saying, to speak to the subject is the fact that when you throw less money at things and you focus on small amounts of films and put good budgets with good people, good cast, good right. crew, and you really focus on it all, you make fantastic films. The French are fantastic at this. If you look at French film, I mean, one of the one of the most famous French films ever is Len. I don't know if you know about this film. It basically translates to... Uh, when the, did it come out? It came out in 95. So it's okay. a very Lan. long... La N. La N. La N. Okay. H-A-I-N-E. Um, and my dyslexia plays with me. Anyways, <laughs> um, but in any case, uh, it's a film about... Um, it's a black and white film, and it's about sort of three kids uh, in the banlieue, which is like the suburbs of Paris, right? It just follows them in 24 hours. Incredible story, shot with real people, not a big budget, shot with an independent studio, one of the most famous French films. There's another independent studio in France that did another film called Le Prénom, uh, which is all shot in one dining room. That's it. And it's one of the most captivating films I've watched. And so I feel like European cinema in general, the Italians, the Spanish, the French, the English, well, less of the English, they're more almost Americanized. They put smaller budgets. But hey, hey, look, uh, the in-betweeners. Fantastic. What, what, fantastic. what a great series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> but they put smaller budget things. They're, they're very European about it. It's like, no, we're going to be tight with our money. We're going to be tight people. Right. But let's make something really cool that's artistic. Right. And what you see is usually the Europeans will always influence American cinema. And then eventually... Yeah, and the yeah, American yeah. I mean, studios, that's, that's from the 60s onwards. Exactly. But then the American studios will come to Europe and they're going to grab the good directors and the good cool. And right. like, here's 800 million... Do whatever you want. Who the hell knew that a bunch of like an Italian director could make some of the best westerns? There you go. Ever made. And this is it, and that, that's how they do. It. And I'm not saying they're bad films, but I mean, that's Sergio Leone, they, you know. amazing, <laughs> amazing, amazing, man. amazing stuff. But yeah, so that's what they do, and um, it's a shame because I think also creativity is usually sparked in uh, in restricted places. Really, that's when you right. become the most creative. If you have everything at your disposal. I think it's harder to be creative. It's usually in restriction. Right. When you're yeah, most and that's creative. what you've seen, like out of the Soviet Union. There hasn't been, there hadn't been a lot of great films come out of there. You know, between let's say 1950 and 1980. I'm not too well versed about that actually, but yeah, yeah. But I mean, then you have some of the best writers from the Soviet, from Russia. So you know, right in places. So usually in places of restriction, where you know, yeah, yeah. you get and create amazing creativity. Um, but, Do you yeah. think that? Uh, at least Western cinema uh, media uh, restricts uh, what people can can say and do. Yeah, so this is what's really interesting. Um, I think, I wouldn't say Western media. I think, yeah, generally Western media do restrict it. But what really restricts it is these big budget studios because they don't want to get any sort of bad press at all. And funnily enough, they still do. So I don't know why they restrict right. it in the first place. Um because they've thrown so much money at these things and they've yeah. invested so much, they need to make a profit. But they haven't been. But they haven't been. And then you get these smaller studios who are kind of like, well, I don't, I don't care, mate. We're here to make art. We're here to push something. And they make something that's so off the grid that everyone's like, hang on, this is kind of interesting. Right. And the fact that it's almost controversial gets it loads of attention. And then these right. films make tons of money. And so that's what usually happens. Um, I mean, one, one movie that flew completely under the radar was Guy Ritchie's The Covenant. That incredible film. But that was a big budget film, though. That right. was still a big budget film, but an incredible but film. Right after that, I, I don't know if you saw it, I, th I thought it was fantastic. I mean, no name actors. There's two actors in there that I'm like, get good agents because you are, you are heading places, was uh, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Yeah, so I haven't watched that, but I've heard about it. And yeah. you've talked about it a little bit, and apparently that's an incredible film. An incredible yeah, I film. mean, it's it's super simple premise, like how to blow up a pipeline. And, and I think yeah. I checked the budget. It was like only a million or a million and a half. It's like right. a very small right. budget film. So, I mean, it's you really only have like two kinds of films. Super small budget, let's say under five million, and mm. then, you know, $200 million. 
there hasn't been like uh, and I, the the film that kind of keeps popping up in my head as like that mid budget range would be something like Cheaper by the Dozen or let's say Home Alone or something like that. Mm. Like where it's like, you know, it costs you 30 or 40 or 50 million to make. And then it goes on to make like over the course of, you know, it's theatrical release, you know, $100 million. Yeah. I mean, so this is where it might be controversial. I think a lot of people would say that, okay, we need to get into this mid range and get into these like budgets that are 30 million and try to make a profit from them. Right. You don't need to. I think like from my experience so far in the film industry and what I find is I've been talking to these writers and these, these directors and producers who've self-produced, wrote their own stuff and done them. And to get into these festivals, some of these, you need to actually have a big budget. They're like, we don't want anything below a million, right? And so they'll just lie on the balance sheets, which is a terrible right. thing to do. And they've made this film for 50 to to $100,000. And, uh, and then they win the film festivals with it. So I know a few writers who've done that and they won... Well, actually, then I can't say the film festivals. So they, they've won like not can, but like pretty damn good film festivals, like on the part of like Monaco film festival and all that. Mm -hmm. They've won best film there. They've made their films for 50,000 to a hundred thousand with unknown actors. And I've watched these films. They're incredible films. Um, and they've turned profits. And so actually we don't need to make 30 million films. Anything around the 3 million mark, you can make an unbelievable film. As long as you right. don't want to blow up a helicopter and like blow up like 50 right, Range Rovers, right. which you don't need for a good film. Right. And if you do... Mike, Michael Bay. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, you know. And if you do, go to the big studios, if that's what you need. But for the majority of stories that are being told, and I think right. that's ultimately what film is. It's a storytelling. It's a way to storytell. You don't need like 200 million. You don't even need 30. And now with equipment being so cheap, I mean like even the picture quality in this camera... Right, yeah, we're incredible. shooting on a Nikon D850. D850, I mean, it's pretty damn good. The lighting, I mean, we could light better, but like, frankly, for 200 quid, we could light even, like, we could have professional lighting system. Right. Um, so, yeah, for a million to two million, I mean, mate, if I had two million to make a film right now, I could make, like, a film that could win at Cannes Film Festival. You don't need that much money. Yeah. You just need the right story and the right story. The right story, the right character development, mm. which has been a big problem over the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years. Now, the, the one question I always love to mm. pose to anybody I talk to about movies, what's the last good comedy you've seen? Like the <laughs> one where you laugh so hard, you spit out your drink, funny. Must be like super bad or something like that, right? Right. Or yeah. I, I, I go back all the way to, um, so it's 2008, Tropic Thunder. Oh, that's a great film. <laughs> I mean, you that's couldn't make that film. movie today. It's funny, you but couldn't make you it. You couldn't though. make it today, but you should make it today. So I think you should, but the other thing is now, and I, this might surprise you, is I come from a generation that's really desensitized mm. in the sense that we see so much stuff and we consume so much content that actually, firstly, lots of people don't even know how to form their own opinions anymore. And it's quite hard to form an opinion. I find myself sometimes thinking on certain subjects and not knowing what opinion I have on it because I've consumed way too much content. Right. Um, I actually, I'm, a, I'm the opposite. I don't have an opinion on certain subjects until I look at content. Well, there you go. And so we've, but then there's obviously some subjects which I don't know anything about and most people don't. But right. we've consumed so much content, lots of it that's like desensitized, a lot, uh, desensitized us a lot that I think a lot of jokes are no longer funny to a lot of us. Right. Um, and so to see something on screen, you'd have to really go to an extreme. And I think some studios are actually not willing to go to that extreme. Right. But that's what art is. It's pushing boundaries. Yeah. And that's what the film coming out that I'm doing. Uh, and I'm going to start filming, I think in June is doing it's, it's like, we realize that my generation is desensitized. We're doing this for my generation. We're not trying to make people angry or anything, right. but we are, we're, we've definitely pushed that. If I wanted to get canceled, this film is going to do it. Like this is the, my I mean, fantastic. Film. Um, don't like, cancel him. Right? Yeah. 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 He, but, He's just a kid. Uh, yeah, but we're just trying to push boundaries and open up a conversation. I think that's one right. thing that's lacked, right. definitely, is the fact that people don't want to speak. And I think that also speaks, well, we won't get into politics, but for the US itself, it's so divided, I think. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's the, obviously, you know, not mentioning politics, but Twitter, uh, Elon Musk, when the Twitter files came out, you know, it showed that they were censoring people whose views they didn't agree, agree yeah. with. And then Elon Musk came in and is like, no, 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 like... As long as you're not making threats to people, you know, yeah. under the confines of the law, you should be able good. to say. And then, and you know, he you he, he put uh, Alex Jones back on the platform. Yeah, and I think also lots of people misunderstand what purpose, like the purpose of certain things. So, for example, with, with my film I'm making or any film in general, 
if a big studio wants to make a film that's a bit controversial or actually very controversial, it's like, well, what's the purpose of that film? What are they trying to do? You know, if they make something that's really racist or really sexist or really homophobic, it's like, are they really homophobic or are they trying to just see what people's reactions are and open up a conversation? Right. And so, but... To um, figure out the state of the human condition yeah. in that. And I think, but now we're part of a, and we definitely live in a society in which we're all based on reaction and no thinking. We lack critical yeah. thinking. And so that's why studios are scared to put these films out. But that's why. Like a, a lot of critical thinking. Like you're, we haven't gotten, you know, a Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. Since Shawshank, Shawshank Redemption. Redemption. Yeah. And films that really make you think. Yeah. I don't know. But I think, um, yeah, people lack, need to realize what the purpose of the film is. And if you need to put a disclaimer before a film, just to say, look, we don't want to trigger anyone. This is just open up conversation. It's all just a joke. Don't worry. But you should know that. But people you know, there, should know there, that. People like there, there doesn't need to be a disclaimer. That that you know that's the and this started with my generation. The the trigger warnings and the safe spaces. You know you can fuck off with all that. Yeah, I think yeah trigger warnings for sure. I mean safe spaces for th- certain things of course. But like, I think in film and in art especially. It shouldn't be a safe space. It's art. You're meant to. It's right. meant to be interpreted. And if if you interpret it in your own way that triggers you, that's exactly what it's meant to do. And some right. people might look at it and think it's beautiful, and some people might think, "Oh, this is actually completely fine and agree with it." That's what art is. And what could Schindler's List make, get made today? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that that's a <laughs> very triggering that. film. Yeah, but people understand the purpose of that, and that right. that's the whole point. And people did. I don't know about people now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. I think you need to, but I think you need to have a certain amount of intelligence anyway. So what? Sh- sh- is you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. So that's it's the not mass market cinema. Yeah, definitely, definitely <laughs> not. <laughs> but but this goes for everything. I mean, the thing is, is like just because you don't like it now doesn't mean that people won't like it in the future. Right. And we see this also with artists in the past. So you have the impressionists who people completely rejected at the time. Right. All these fantastic pe- uh, artists like Van Gogh, Monet, um, Renoir, all these people who got completely rejected from society right. and um and now they're actually known as some of the best artists ever to live and if you don't know anything about art you still know who van gogh is right that's what art is it's meant to be interpreted throughout the ages um, yeah just because you don't like it now doesn't mean that later it won't be good and i think i mean a lot a lot of uh a lot of films weren't appreciated at the time Prime example, Shawshank Redemption. Exactly. Wasn't even on, on the ballot for, for best, best Picture in 94. Yeah. You know, yeah, okay, Forrest Gump won, and that's a good movie, but I'm sorry, Shawshank is better, right? Objectively? <laughs> Objectively, yeah. If, uh, subjectively, I'm going to say. Subjectively. Because uh, I love both films. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I would mean, personally I'm, say... I'm, there's nothing against, I have nothing against Forrest Gump. I think it's a mm. great film. I, I prefer <clears throat> Forrest Gump, but I personally think that Shawshank's a better film. Right. If that makes sense. But yeah, no, it's 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 really a shame that thing needs, things need to be censored now and that audiences need to be told to not get triggered. I mean, it's like... Yeah, I mean... That it, shouldn't have to happen. Really. But there are people fighting back, namely Bill Burr, uh, Dave Chappelle. Yeah, Dave Chappelle's a good one. I watched his comedy show recently right, the i know dreamer. you have as well yeah, yeah that was really good yeah and it's i think comedians actually are a great example of people who push boundaries because that's what comedy you is. have to you have to otherwise it's not comedic um it's like you push boundaries until like nobody laughs and it's like okay, okay maybe then, i went too far. too far exactly <clears throat> it's like no one's gonna laugh about the chicken crossing the road anymore that's all right, so we're back after some technical difficulties. difficulties. Uh, thank you, Nikon D850, for just clicking off. I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, well, look, but if any case, we'll just put a disclaimer and then cut it out. It's yeah, we can, we can just cool. cut that out. Uh, so, you know, what do you think the messaging has done over time in films? Like, because films do have a message, like the color purple, uh, you know, um, uh, Films like The Matrix, Fight Club. Uh, Fight Club's a great example, actually, of messages, yeah. Yeah, you know, how, how do you think that's evolved over... And I know, like, I haven't watched nearly as much, many movies as there are in the universe, um, but I've seen, you know, sort of movies from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, all the way up to today, and, you know, you can definitely see people playing it safe in the 1950s because of like the McCarthy era, like anti-communism crap um, that, 
you know, what was around in the fifties and then you get a counter reaction to that, like in movies in the, from the sixties and seventies. And then you kind of get the safe films again in the eighties, you know, the, the diehards, the home alones, the, um, uh, mm. breakfast clubs, and then you get little, little edgier stuff in the nineties. Mm. Like, so, you know, tell me more about your opinion about that. In, uh, and how, how it is today? Or? Versus, you know, over time, how do, you, how do you view the evolution? I mean, I'm quite young also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't yeah. watched enough films, I think, to comment too much on this. But I think where you are right is the 90s definitely challenged film. I mean, like with the introduction of Tarantino and his right. films are so gory. I mean, they're so gory <laughs> and they're very much a replica of the old Westerns, but he's pushed them to another le- right. limit. Uh, and he, and the, the thing about him, uh, when I was reading like what films influenced him, because uh, he's all about dialogue. Like you mm. watch a movie like Pulp Fiction. Um, uh, I know he didn't direct it, but uh, he wrote, um, uh, no, he, he directed Reservoir Dogs, uh, but it was True Romance that he wrote but didn't direct. Mm. And like those movies are all about dialogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, in the 90s, I mean, definitely we, they tried to push film to a new level. Uh, 2000s, I mean, was just kind of like, I think 90s to like 2010 was the golden age, really. And then... I mean, aside from the 40s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And then, and then it's just kind of dropped off now. I think right. we've lost it. I think messages of films have been so clear. That's the problem now. It's like you There's watch, no nuance anymore. You watch Fight Club. You can watch it as a film that's quite entertaining, that you didn't quite understand until the end. Or you can watch it as a comment on society on what men are like and what men need. Or at least Tarantino's right. thought of what he, they, he thinks men yeah. need in David society. Fincher. Sorry, Fincher. Yeah. Uh, thinks that they need in uh, society. Um, but now it's so clear. I mean, Snow White being black, it's obvious what your message is trying to be there. Right. But that's more marketing and pandering. Which is, I, I don't know if you saw the South Park special uh, joining the Panderverse, where no. I mean, it was hysterical. Really? You know, they, they go through and they, they say how lazy the, uh, the multiverse stuff is. And then you have Kathleen Kennedy was saying, you know, put a chicken and make her gay. Right. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but see, I think ultimately that maybe not, might not be the message of the film entirely, but yeah, I honestly, I haven't watched too many recent films. And the only ones I have watched have been like really good, critically well acclaimed films like Oppenheimer, mm. The Covenant, which was fantastic. Those films I watched because the message there is, for one, it's not very clear. And it's, right. I mean, Oppenheimer is more of a historical film anyway. I so, mean, you and yeah. I are both uh, huge fans of Christopher Nolan. Oh, mate, I love the guy. <laughs> I love the guy. I mean, if I can make a film with Nolan, I'd be like over the moon. But he's got a big problem. We talk about dialogue. With talk about dialogue, dialogue, yeah. Yeah, well, talk about it. There is no talking. You can't hear shit. <laughs> right, the sound <laughs> editing is terrible. Yeah. But, um, but And that's his thing. I'm like, that's his thing. but why? Yeah, I know, I know. But that's just his little trademark, I guess. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, no, I, I love Nolan films. But I think I don't watch um, I don't watch too many modern films that come out nowadays. For one, with Netflix, with so much stuff that comes right. out. Right. And even when you go to the Oscars now, I think like I watched a few of the films on the last Oscars. Or like a couple they weren't of years that ago. great. They weren't that great. Like they're really not that great. But there's a social commentary. I remember a few years ago, uh, Nomadland came out. That was and a that, good film. That was, that was a, a, very that was a film. social yeah. commentary on like, not the evils of Amazon. Well, yes, the evils of Amazon. But, you know, about how treat, you know, people treat workers, not only workers, but also you know, the, the so-called like left behind, right? Yeah. So like the 50 to 70 year olds that got screwed over by globalization. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, that, that's where you get movements like MAGA, uh, Mm. you know, and Trump. And I think it also is a big comment on the overbearing, uh, capitalistic America. Right. That's, that's one. Right. Overly consumeristic. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. All of that. Um, no, that was a very interesting film to watch. Um, there's a lot of Korean films coming out now that are oh really fantastic, God. but I haven't watched too many of them. But from I, what I've, I've heard, got one recommendation for you and everybody out there. Yeah. 2003, Old Boy. Old Boy, really? Oh my God, you have got to see that. It is a basically a treatise on revenge. Okay. It takes the revenge story 
and flips everything upside down. Well, and I'm, it's just like, when you get to the end, you're like, wow, okay. Oh, oh, fuck. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, man, I need to get into Korean cinema. I mean, that's what I'm studying next term, actually. Um, yeah, Train to Busan was another one. Okay, uh, I've heard of that one. Look, it was standard run of the mill zombie movie. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's just so well done. Yeah. yeah, yeah like the yeah, cinematography, yeah. the story is super simple, easy to follow. Mm. The characters, like, yeah, they start dropping off because, well, it's a zombie movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, but, yeah, it was so well done. Man, that, that is, we, we need to get more good films coming in. But it's this issue. We need to get back to the basics. That's the main thing. Back to Story. The basics. Story. Character development. And character development. That's it. Yeah. yeah. We don't need all these big actors. I think also a lot of the budgets nowadays on films are going... This is the other problem with streaming. We were talking about streaming before. Is that now no one goes to the cinema as much anymore. Right. And so these big budget studio films don't get any box office tickets at all. And so I don't know what they bank on anymore. I think they bank on distributing it after to a streaming platform and getting right. mostly there. Because you're not getting the box office tickets yeah. anyways. And so when you're getting these big name actors in who are asking to get paid millions upon millions for a film, it's like, how are you going to make your money back? Right. So. Right. And you don't need big name actors yeah, as, as how to blow up a pipeline. Exactly. I mean, that that Native American kid in that movie, look him up. God damn, he's a good actor. Mm. Like some of it is blank. Like he really like emotes anger and like numbness mm. uh, of his anger. I mean, they're still great actors. Like, the greats, like, you know, the Capri and all that, are fantastic. But I've even got friends who shot lots of short films. Lots of sure, like, yeah. And, like, short features, so, like, 40-minute features with unknown actors who they didn't even pay, just wanted to get screen time. And, honestly, you can't tell a big difference between, like, the amazing actors and those. Like, right. there is a difference, but it's so slight that, I mean, frankly, why are you paying millions upon millions for actors? Right. There's no point. And so also, you, you, you know, you have, like, De Niro, Pacino, uh, you know, the, 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 the greats. And cer- certainly... Yeah, for you, those are the greats, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. I mean, you know, uh, well, De Niro's been around. F- I just watched Taxi Driver for the first time. I still need to watch that film. Uh, it's kind of messed up. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And actually, I would say it's a sort of pseudo-sequel to uh, Fight Club. Because it's a message of like leaving behind men. Well, so is the Joker, society. actually. Right. Funny enough, yeah. so is the Joker, which I quite... I mean, the I Joker and, and Taxi Driver are very similar films. Really? Okay. F- like similar plot lines. Interesting. Okay, I need to watch Taxi Driver. I might do that tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, it, that was a good movie. But then, you know, there, there's smaller actors that, for example, I remember, uh, I don't know if you've seen the, the, the movies like Before, Before Sunset, Before... Uh, well, it's like the Before trilogy no, no, of films, and it's all about dialogue. It's Ethan Hawke and I, this French actress, I think she's French, mm. just walking around talking about ev- anything. That sounds great. And it, yeah, they were, cool? they were great. Uh, I think the first one was called Before Sunset. It sounds like a film I'd love to watch, actually. Yeah. Because it's, it's like they, they meet, they talk, and then they don't see each other for 10 years. And then the second film is like 10 years later. They meet, they talk, talk, talk. Mm. And then they don't, you don't see them again for 10 years. And it was like the re- uh, evolution of their relationship. I so, see, that's an amazing story. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's an incredible story. And it was Ethan Hawke when he was not famous mm. whatsoever. This was like pre-Gattaca amazing. Ethan Hawke. See, that's a film I'd love to watch. But the other thing is my generation doesn't have the attention span to watch a conversation for an hour and a half. Well, that's, yeah. That's the problem. But that is an incredible film. That's the kind of film... Now, do you think that uh, your generation doesn't have the attention span or that the conversations in film aren't that good? So, for example, like with, with uh, going back to Tarantino, one of the movies that inspired Pulp Fiction was a 1940 movie called His Girl Friday. Mm-hmm which I saw a few months ago, and I'm like, this is one of the best written films I've mm. ever... Like, the dialogue was just, poof, 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 mm. you know, super witty. It's, um, you know, you, you had uh, screenwriters like Aaron Sorkin with uh, The West Wing, where it's like the, the quick back and forth, but like, His Girl Friday in 1940 was much better than that. Mm. Like, they just pulled it off. Right. Uh, so do you think that the quality 
of dialogue and story is what's contributing to your generation not having the attention span. I think in mainstream movies, yeah. The ones that are getting marketed, for example, yeah, I think they probably declined quite a bit. And they've become... A lot of the lines are getting reused. It's almost like you can watch a Marvel film now and know what the character is going to say before they even right. say it. So it's quite obvious. And for some reason, I think we like that. I think it's like, that's quite a human thing. We like the familiarity mm. of knowing what people yeah. are going to say. But I, do, I also do want to preface, though, I'm not saying that you know, everyone has a short attention span and no one wants to watch these films. I know lots of people who love watching these kind of films. And if it's there and marketed, they will 100% watch it. And I think my generation, if they are marketed the right things... Like Barbenheimer. I have not watched that film. I have not. No, no, no. Barbie and Oppenheimer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I was going to say, I was like... Yeah, that, that was like really... the whole marketing okay, thing okay. of last summer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, if they're marketed right, and these films... Are, I mean, so many people watched Oppenheimer... Lots of people didn't actually like Oppenheimer as much. And if they said they did, it's just because they wanted to conform to what other people Sure, <laughs> You sure. know what I mean? It's kind of like uh, drinking IPAs. Yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> we have a different opinion on I that. I like IPAs, yeah. personally. But, like, that film's pretty damn long. I loved it. I appreciated it. Uh, but I think for a lot of people, it was a bit too three, long. Three hours is, is long for long. a movie. Yeah, yeah. But in any case, I think if the right films are marketed and, you know, they're shown to people with good dialogue, yeah, of course. I think the films are out there. They're just not getting pushed, and that's it. Yeah, I mean, the, there's there's movies that their their marketing sucked. Uh, one off the top of my head was last summer, uh, Seth Rogen uh, directed uh, and wrote the Ninja Turtles movie. Yeah, I mean, the art style incredible. Like, I think he should win the Oscar for best animated feature. Mm. Uh, story pretty simple and blew completely under the radar so i saw clips of that it looked visually incredible. beautiful yeah it looked incredible um and i didn't watch it yeah it did flow under the radar no one knew about this film. nobody knew about it yeah and then there's films that are completely blocked from the mainstream key example sound of freedom yeah okay so i haven't watched the film yet i'm yet to watch it but i've yeah. heard all the controversy on it <laughs> sure and I mean, it's pretty obvious why it got blocked by by, uh, I mean, by yeah. the media. Yeah, <laughs> Harvey, Harvey Weinstein. Uh, you yeah, know, yeah. That, that's still alive, all, all alive and well, you know. But, but yeah, no, these films are definitely out there. They just need to be pushed right. And um, now yeah. let me tell. Let me ask you this. Uh, you know, I just wrote a book, uh, and it's like you know. We've got like a 1.7% chance it gets made into a movie. Mm. Uh, so many books are coming out and so many movies are coming out. Do you think that it's all about how it's marketed or it's really about quality or about both? Well, quality stands the test of time. Yeah. It always will. A good book will always stand the test. Dickens, you have all of these great writers who... Have stood the test. I mean, of time. I'm not saying I'm Dickens. Like, no, 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 no. Uh, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> I got to be a little humble. It's like, worry, I'm not saying you are book. either. I'm not saying you are either. But um, I think it's a mixture of both. You know, like if you have something that you market incredibly well and it's terrible, you might get a lot of buys. Like the iPhone. Like the iPhone. The iPhones are great. <laughs> but uh, this is you, another Android guy. Yeah, yeah. I, but I actually want to get an iPhone now. Oh. Uh. <laughs> It's just, man, I need to connect to, you know. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's like, but anyways, um, yeah, so I think you can definitely market a book and people will buy it, but or like a film and people will go watch it. But ultimately, you know, the reviews will show. And so if it's shit, no one's going to go see it. In the end. Right. It won't stand the test of time. Um, so I think more focus should be put on quality. But like with everything, if you don't market it right, Right. You're not going to get that. How to blow up a pipeline is a good idea. I don't think probably anyone listening to this now has even watched that film. Right. Um, Beautiful Boy, which is even done by Amazon, was marketed terribly. Terribly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I didn't hear about it until you told me man, about it. I, I really do love that film. Uh, funny enough, I've got another friend. I've got a few friends actually who hate the film. They think it's a terrible film. So then again, it's also I mean, it's sad as fuck. Yeah, it's depressing. <laughs> like, it's, 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 it's super really depressing. depressing. Actually, I like, <laughs> it's so bad in terms of, it's so depressing. Like, if you don't want your kids to do drugs, just show them that thing. <laughs> show them that movie, <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you're an addict, don't, like, that's a good film to, I don't know anything. But um, but yeah, no. Um, yeah, marketing is a massive part of film and music and anything you want. I mean... I mean, it's, it's basically the film's budget. Like, uh, so... 
what was it? The Marvels, uh, their quote unquote budget was 275 million. So they have to spend 275 million to get the, th the thing distributed and marketed. Uh, and then they didn't even, I mean, they, that was a huge flop. And what I find so dumb is the fact that now that everything is digital, it should be cheaper. Right. right yeah. And so the thing is, is that, so before they used to make a film and then when you want to show it into a cinema, the reason why there was delayed showings of screenings was because you had to make the film. And so studios spent less money on the actual film because, you know, it was recorded yeah, yeah. in the film. So they'd maybe make, you know, I don't know, 300 copies of the film, right? They'd show it into all the cinemas in California. And then once they were done there, they'd move all those film copies yeah. on and on and on and then right. get to Europe. Now that it's digital, it's cheap. You can just send it on the phone and like, you know. Yeah. And so I don't really know why we need to spend so much on a marketing budget and so much on sort of making these films. We, we don't, we shouldn't have to. Right. Um, I just, we're in an age where we consume so much content, I think. To make you think there's too much? Too much content? Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, yeah. 10 years ago, people were talking about the news having too much stuff, and now... Yeah, I mean, so the news completely, and I don't know how it is in England, you can talk, to, talk about that. Uh, you know, we had... You know, on the on the left you have CNN and MSNBC. On the right you have F Fox News, and that's basically how we had our news delivered for a long time. Anybody my age and younger, I mean, they're not watching CNN and Fox News. That doesn't matter what their what 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 their political leanings are. Everybody moved online, and yeah. honestly, the content coming out of let's say. And I'm going to go both left and right, like the Young Turks, Breaking Points, the Daily Wire, uh, you know, that's a uh, uh, democracy now. Uh, that stuff is a lot better and more nuanced arguments, more nuanced takes on stuff. Mm. Uh, you know, you had, um, you know, in Democracy Now, the, uh, a video came out yesterday or today. Uh, with a uh, former IDF soldier talking about like the nuance between being Israeli, being Zionist, and being Jewish. Interesting. It's like, okay, you're never seeing that on CNN or Fox. Never. Yeah. never. I mean, I do, so I do read BBC. That's something I'm, yeah. I'm an old soul because I don't think anyone my age reads BBC news. <laughs> <laughs> but I sometimes... What do people your age read? read in, like, how do they consume news? I mean, that's a, that's a... Firstly, let's unpack the first question. What do people read my age? Yeah. I don't think most, most people read anymore, actually. Most people, if they do get their news, it'd be from YouTube. Right. Um, well, well, how I get my news. But people still definitely read my age. It's just not as much as it was before. And it's so it's easy to tell that people don't read anymore because the ne level of vocabulary has diminished so much. From, oh, yeah. From like, you know, 50 years ago. You see, um, yeah. But, um, yeah, I don't really know how people consume news nowadays. I mostly say, like, they either read the BBC in the UK. I've, but then I've got friends who are very... I've got a few who I do talk about politics with are very much ingrained into it and they love politics. So they'll be reading up on BBC News, but... I guess the average person just doesn't. They hear about it through TikTok. I think that's the main news given yeah. TikTok, which is a bit of a shame because now there's so, Twitter. Much, there's so much fake news. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of people who use Twitter. At least I don't. I've got one friend who uses Twitter. All the rest don't use yeah. Twitter. Like pe people my age use Twitter a lot for news delivery. So for example, I live in New York. Uh, I want to know what the hell's going on with my subway. Like, hey, I'm on the queue, you know, between 34th and 42nd stuck. What the hell's going on? Somebody right. posts about it on Twitter. Interesting. I I can't... First, ahead of like the NYPD or the really? MTA or whoever. So I know we do get that on Twitter. And I know like if something's going on, I'll go on Twitter just to quickly see what's going on. Yeah, happening. yeah. So I remember when Ukraine first attacked... Uh, not when Ukraine attacked, but when Russia attacked Ukraine for the <laughs> right. first time. First place I went to was Twitter. Right. But I don't, I don't use Twitter too often. Um, actually, I barely use it at all. I think most people get their news and their information from TikTok and like Instagram now. That's yeah. probably the biggest news giver. Um, the algorithm doesn't show me that. At least Instagrams, yeah. it, it, it's it's uh, you know cute uh, raccoon videos and <laughs> hot girls. <laughs> yeah, know? I mean, I so funny. I know that a lot of these news companies have been moving to TikTok. So you got Sky News on TikTok now. Really, BBC's on TikTok. Mm -hmm. You've even got uh, sort of like you know YouTube companies like Vice, for example. Mm -hmm. um, well, they're not even a YouTube company, but Vice News even they're on TikTok. Right. They're all moving TikTok because they know that's where all the information comes from. I think now I can't remember if I checked, but like 
I think YouTube used to be one of the biggest browsers, wasn't it, for information at one point? Mm -hmm. And then I think now it's, I don't know if it has been overpassed by TikTok yet, but it, we're nearly there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and there's other competitors coming up uh, online, uh, Rumble. Yeah, but I don't think that's close to TikTok though, is it? No, 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 no. I mean, it, it's not even close to YouTube. Uh, it's yeah, just a different platform. But it's coming up, yeah. 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 But TikTok is there. I, th I think it's like 33% of people get their information from TikTok. People your age. Uh, or over, all, all overall. Over, overall, right. 33% of all people get their information from TikTok and using it as a web browser. Right. And he, I won't lie, even I do. Well, I used to, not anymore. But right. I used to, you know, if I wanted to see quickly how to chick cook a chicken, I'm not going on Google. You go on TikTok. You see the one that's most viewed. Chicken looks pretty damn good. 15 seconds, I find out literally the quick instructions. That was it. Right. It's yeah. I mean, I, whenever I'm searching for a recipe, you know, I, I Google it mm -hmm. and it'll be like some, some website and it's like the woman goes, or man, sorry, uh, anybody can cook. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he, they go on and on and on. And I'm like, I just want to know what the ingredients are. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't need a whole essay here. BBC Good Food's my, my shout. That's the one that I use. But not the fried rice. I, I don't know. If, if you recall, that's how Uncle Roger got Is went it? viral. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good food. I didn't know that. Uncle yeah. Roger's a funny guy. Man. Yeah, He's a yeah. Funny guy. But yeah, yeah. No, I don't know. I've, yeah, people get their media in all sorts of forms, but now it's moving to short form content. I, I think, as we've been saying, I yeah. Think that's do you think cinema it. can do short form content? No, or? it's impossible. It's impossible. Like how how can you pack a film like Boys in the Boat in a thirty second clip? Yeah, you really can't. You really can't. You can't even do it in the trailer. You can't even do it in the trailer. And here's the thing. It's like short films exist and they're great. And so, yeah. yeah, short form cinema does exist and it's fantastic and it's got its place. But so does long form. Right. And it's like, it's. I mean, I've watched some short films where for five minutes, I mean, you're absolutely captivated. When it ends, you're like, damn, like, I want to watch more, but there's no, it's only been five minutes. Yeah. But also, cinema's got a place for that. When you can be captivated in a room and not even think about anything else, the whole world, reality itself, fades away yeah, yeah. for an hour and a half, that's an incredible experience. Absolutely. And it's, you can get the same thing with a book. When you're reading a book and suddenly it's been four hours, and you're like, well, okay, hang on, where's time? You're captivated. You're, yeah, yeah. Everything's got its place. Right. And short stories exist and long stories exist. I mean, I've seen one, one video that just popped into my YouTube algorithm, uh, and I, I, I forget the title. But basically, the gist is this woman wakes up in this like sloping concrete thing, like near the ocean or somewhere. And like there's like a chasm and like, you know, if you fall, like you're 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 screwed. And she's trying to like not move so that she doesn't slide down this this thing. Only like a nine minute video, like yeah. a nine minute sh short film. But I'm like, after that, that, that's like. That's good. It doesn't have a lot of plot line, but it's just like, it really makes you think. Funny enough, a lot of amazing short films that I've watched, and they're mostly UK based short films done by like short film independent sure. studios. Uh, they tackle like uh, problems of race and ethnic minorities and LGBTQIA plus sort of all of their problems in such an incredible manner that the big studios have not managed to do. Tell me more about that. So I actually haven't seen any of these. Okay, so it's been a while since I've been working now sure, for, sure. for yeah. two years, so it's been a while since I've had time to watch a lot of stuff. Yeah. But I think one's called like Blue World or something like that. I've really can't, but there's loads and these, there's these channels that do them and they post them on YouTube. And it's just the way that they do it is so great. It's, it's, they, they don't use race as a marketable feature. They use it as really explaining the problem and having a story. And... Um, I mean, I'd love to go into it more if I if I still remembered like yeah. all these films. But I, what I do remember is looking at them and being like truly wowed by them. And the message was clear but nuanced, and you really took something away from the film. Yeah. That was incredible. Like that was art. Like there's some yeah. short films that are true art and sh deserve to be making tons of money. And those filmmakers, I think, deserve to be running the big studios because the big studios have lost the plot when it comes to getting right. these nuanced topics and these controversial like, like topics. Like Disney. Disney's a good example. Yeah. Or Disney, Disney went way too controversial. And then they're getting, you know, parents don't want to take their kids to Disney movies. Is it? Oh, yeah. I no, know I mean, uh, you know, especially with, uh, I mean, the big controversy last year was uh, Lightyear, the, okay. the, the, Buzz, the Buzz Lightyear movie. Okay. Uh, where it had like the first gay kiss or whatever. And it's like, all right, 
the LGBTQ community, it's cool. They exist. Like, you know, leave them alone. Like, don't, don't bother them. Uh, and there is a right time and a right place for kids to learn about that stuff. Like, you yeah, can't yeah, be yeah. introducing that to, like, a three-year-old. Yeah, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. But I think... Like, like there is they're a, making kids like grow up way too quick. I know I grew up way too quick. Probably mm. you too. I think there is a time and a place for that. And I think the classic sort of princess and prince story, mm. which is such a beautiful story, yeah. can quite frankly, and I think almost should be adapted um, to have sort of a prince and a prince story and a princess yeah. and a princess story. Absolutely. But done in the right way. And so I Done in the right films. way, exactly. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't know how these are, but like... You know, the emphasis, I think, on those prince and princess story, which I think that so there's a whole the feminist movement doesn't really like that thing. But I still think it's a very cute story. To yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways. And it's like the emphasis is never on the kiss. You know, right. That's the thing. It's like no right. one cares. But it's finding your life partner. Right. And falling exactly. in love. And it's exactly. that process yeah, of being yeah, like yeah. completely infatuated with someone. That's what it should be about. And yeah. Because it's, it's really hard to find someone. And then when you do. If you know if they happen to be the same sex, then whatever. Like yeah, you're should. lucky to have found your person. That and that's what the emphasis should be on. Yeah. And I think if, and I think they should do representations of that with same sex relationships. Absolutely. Um, but in the right way. I think, like you said, they shouldn't do it in a cheap way and a lazy way. Right. They should create an amazing story where two people right. fall in love and they're infatuated by each other, and it doesn't matter who they are. Really. Right. It's just the, the story of them falling in love is what should matter. And that's there's there's a new movie coming out, uh, and I want to say it's in theaters right now. Uh, let me look it up. Uh, go on the Fandango over here. We need a Jamie from like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, like Jamie from <laughs> Joe Rogan. Yeah, yeah, it's like, uh, hey, look the look, look up this movie really quick. Uh, let's see, my favorite zip code to watch movies in. Favorite movie theater, Kips Bay. Uh, Boys in the boat. No, no, no. All of us strangers. So that's apparently a story of two gay guys. And I, I've got to say it. Like I don't. I've watched the trailer. I'm like, this is pretty damn good. Mm. Uh, well, but I, I think it's like a more traditional romance. It wasn't like a rom com. Have you watched Brokeback Mountain? Yeah, a long time ago. So call me on your name. I think those are two yeah, amazing yeah. examples of like of LGBTQ two, done right, done incredibly right. Where actually everyone's yeah. watching, they're like, wow, like that's so good. like. You watch that and you see sort of two people fall in love and you're like, wow, this is actually incredible. Like, I yeah. wish I had this. Right. Um, but there's, they tried the rom-com route w once that I can think of with the movie Bros. Okay. And it's like, hold on, who is your primary audience for rom-coms traditionally? Yeah, it must be a hetero relationship. Women. Yeah. No, no, no. Oh, wait, wait, oh, wait, okay, women so as the audience, right? So you targeted just the gay community, Really, just just the gays, not like not mm. the L and the and the B and the T and everything else. You just you just did the G, and it's like yeah, no wonder you didn't make a lot of money because your audience you you've reduced it's, the audience from yeah. you know. But again, I I also think that movie didn't do well because it just wasn't a good movie. <laughs> yeah, I I would like to get the LGBTQIA plus um, opinion on their representation in film. Because I think, I, I think for the, I don't want to like step out of line, but I think for some of the people who are really extreme in that community, they just want any kind of representation. Right. If that makes sense. But I think, I mean, I've talked to older people who are gay and part of, well, they actually don't like saying that they're part of the LGBTQIA plus community, right. funnily enough, um, but who are gay and they're like, they say the same things that I'm saying. They're saying it's just cheap. We don't want to be represented. We want to have our story. That's right. It. Yeah. And so I'd like to see what they think about their representation within film and whether they want true representation. Because it kind of, I think the fact that you're saying I want to be represented and they're just throwing you in a film. So they right. throw in a gay character. It's not just cheap, but it's also like, it kind of feels demeaning. Yeah. You know what I mean? If they were like, I know if I was in the film. Pandering. Yeah. I know if, if I was like, look, I want to act in this film. They're like, okay, cool. Um, yeah, we'll just, we'll fit you in in the back. And it's kind of like, no, you haven't gotten the point. I just want to, I want to be in the film. I want to be the film. And it's right. like done in the right. Yeah. I, I don't know. I think it's a bit demeaning the way it's being done at the moment. I think it almost seems like Hollywood 
hasn't accepted. It's almost an offshoot of the race thing. Yeah. And it's like, it's almost like they're not accepting those people. It's kind of like, right. we'll throw them in. Because, they're using them. Yeah. They're using them. And it's like, yeah, we'll put them in because we don't want controversy. It's not like, but it's not a full acceptation. Of right. Them. It's kind of. Right. So I don't know. I think I, I'd like to see an, a, a new incredible film. That it all spoiled. goes back to story. Yeah. Literally. I mean, there, there you go. You mentioned it. Brokeback Mountain. Yeah. Great. Great. Film. Great story. Great actors. Great actors. I mean, Jesus. Yeah. Heath Ledger, rest know, in peace. But uh, Probably one of the best actors to ever live, actually. Oh, my I God. Think, yeah. But, um, no, I think, I think we definitely need to have some new films that really represent these communities. And not just the LGBTQIA plus community, but, like, uh, the feminist community. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, that really needs a new film. Because like, the last good one, I think, well, good, I didn't watch it, but from what I heard, Ocean's 8 was, like, the last kind of good film. Oh, like, one. chick, like chick centric yeah exactly but like having great female protagonists like right. i yeah. mean well the the one you know, i've talked about this in all my videos about female protagonists like there's a, a way to do it correctly mm. I, I don't know if you've seen kill bill the no. bride from kill bill holy crap Done great. like phenomenal mm. uma thurman just knocked it out of the ballpark uh i hate to keep going back to it uh but ripley from the alien franchise mm. played by sigourney weaver uh phenomenal fantastic yeah. you know it's like you're the original alien movie from 1979 i watched it maybe a couple years ago uh because i watched it when i was a kid uh i, I was i was de talk about being desensitized i was watching you know the exorcist when i was five yeah, yeah. <laughs> but i went back and i and i watched uh alien from like an adult perspective i'm like okay the atmosphere is great uh, you know, it's it's kind of like that um, video game uh, Dead Space, which I'm sure Dead Space played off of Alien. Um, and you know, she starts off weak. All her like crewmates are getting picked off, and uh, you know, until the very end, where you know she takes the uh, the exoskeleton and like you know shoves the alien into space or whatever. Mm. Um, you know, that shows like a strong properly strong female character mm. uh, with a story arc. Uh, Sarah Connor, perfect example. First Terminator movie, she's just a waitress. Mm. You know, yes, she has like the, uh, Kyle Reese save her, but in between Terminator 1 and Terminator 2, she became a goddamn badass. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, he, she, she, she was like training with like Nicaraguan rebels yeah, 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 <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. in the jungle. <laughs> like, so by Terminator exactly. 2, you're like, all right, know, like yeah. this is, and even like uh, Lara Croft in like the video game series, <coughs> yep. Tomb Raider. I mean, that's another great example. No, we need more of that, hundred percent. Yeah, we definitely need more of that, but like subtly. That makes yeah. sense. That's the way to do it. Right. Not make it the forefront and just be like, wow, actually, that's a really cool character. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, you know, you have, you have people. Let's say like Martin Scorsese making comments about you know the state of cinema amongst like the YouTube community like I'm talking like th this guy's already in here you know we're just two guys shooting mm. the shit on YouTube yeah uh you know making commentary of you know I, and I think I showed you the uh the article uh where he was criticizing Marvel movies that it, it, it's just a, yeah. it's like content it's not cinema um <laughs> his latest movie uh I read the book uh, I reviewed it. Uh, I reviewed the um, the movie. Was him too far up his own ass? Like if Tenet was Christopher Nolan, Nolan. too far up his uh, his own ass? <laughs> Killers of the Flower like... Moon was okay. Martin Scorsese too far up his own ass. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, it, it, the movie was three and a half hours long, and I read the book. The first forty five minutes of the movie weren't even in the book. You don't even need that. Yeah. yeah. So. I mean, yeah. So that's well, what you want my take on the Marvel films then is content and, or? No, I mean, uh, you know, it's where do you think cinema is going after, you know, Endgame? And then, I mean, it's been an utter disaster uh, since Endgame. Yeah. Uh, but where do you think cinema is going? A lot, a lot of YouTubers are saying like, you know, the Critical Drinker brought this up that, okay, comic book movies are, de are dead, but now like we're moving into video game adaptations. Yeah, I um. I think it's quite clear that we're going back to a good golden age of cinema. I think people are sick of these stories that are happening now, or that are being made now. Um, the want to sort of push agendas that right. are like a bit too clear. I mean, it's, we just talked about it. We'd love to have these kind of films, but just like 
come on, make a really good film and don't focus so much on the agenda. Right. Um, at least in my opinion, people would disagree, I guess. Um, and, um, but I think that's coming back. I think it is coming back. I think the rise of independent studios is going to start coming back. Yeah. I mean, A24 has been killing it for they are. a decade plus. Oh my God. And Neon as well. Neon, yeah. yeah Neon's the yeah. new, but like Neon distributed. Uh, I first heard of them. I believe they did one BR, which was this mm. uh, um, this horror movie. But uh, Neon distributed How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like. That's what I'm saying. So I think, but they, they lack budget to market it more. Right. But it's going to come because people are going to start seeing these films. That's going to right. Yeah. Um, where exactly it's going, I I would say like the old stories are going to come back. People are going to be less scared to put out sort of these more nuanced films that like have stronger messages and are quite controversial. I would say in certain manners and uh, in certain aspects. Um, but in terms of how we consume cinema, mm. I have no idea. I don't know if that's going to stay in terms of streaming or if that's going to. That, yeah, there's just there's something magical about like. Going to a theater, I know. like That's the, thing, so, yeah. the shitty popcorn. I mean, I pop my own and bring it in because, like, mm. I do my I, I do my popcorn stovetop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, you can't beat that. Yeah. But there's something, you know. And I, I had a job when I was in high school. This is actually a funny, funny story. I don't know if I've told you. Uh, I, I didn't work very long at the Regal um, in, in my mom's town. Uh, you know classic like high school kid dickhead yeah like boss tells you to go make popcorn like only put in like i don't know x amount of salt i just like pour the whole thing in people are complaining about like the popcorn (laughs) being too too salty salty. (laughs) but that's funny though that's what's good like uh, right and it lacks that and i think that's that speaks for a lot of other things like you you, you need to have like that sort of interaction as an adult with, like, the dickhead kid, you the to. teenager. It's funny, because you see yourself in them. I think people are going out less as well. People are staying home, I think, after Well, COVID that was the pandemic. Like, but even now, I think, like, my generation, I mean, everything's online. People stay on their phones more. People go out less. People aren't in nature as much. I think with every single aspect, people are just not out as much. Um, whether that's a good or bad thing, I don't know, but... And, I mean... I've, I've listened to a bunch of podcasts. Uh, Andrew Huberman, Chris Williamson has talked about this for, you know, a decent amount. Uh, kids are drinking less. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. I would say... Maybe maybe kids in the US and not the UK. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I would say I would say definitely kids in France and the UK are not drinking less. That's for sure. <laughs> that's definitely for sure. In fact, I think I think now I saw a statistic. Uh, maybe we're drinking less, but I think kids now are also. This is so far off topic, but <laughs> they're definitely doing more drugs. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people are now. Despite what the statistics say, I don't care what the statistics say because where I've been, everywhere I've been, everyone smokes now. Doesn't matter mm. what, like vaping, but also smoking cigarettes. Is it a UK thing or a French thing or? All right. Well, the French worldwide. smoke. I mean, like yeah, I, li- yeah. I lived in a flat. You can smoke inside your flat. You're legally allowed to smoke wherever you want as long as it's not in the property of someone else who sure. hasn't accepted it. So I could literally be at my desk working and smoking at the same time. Uh, if you go to a party in France, everyone's smoking in the flat. No one cares. It's very rare to find someone who doesn't smoke in France. UK, it's a lot easier to find people who don't smoke. But if you don't smoke, you probably vape. And I mean, I think that's that's what took over here is vaping. vaping. Yeah, it's not smoking. I would say it's worse. Um, <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Right. I've, I've done both. And I can say my lungs feel a lot worse after vaping than they do smoking. We initially connected you know, over YouTube uh, and... You know, I saw your music or I heard your music, listened to it. Uh, you know, how do you view as a musician music and film? Well, Oppenheim is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, that's incredible. Music. Yeah. We're, we're, <laughs> I mean, the score, we, we, we don't want to suck up to Chris, Chris Nolan. Man, <laughs> it's much. good though. You know, it's really good. Um, no, it is good. I think um, music and film is... It's hard to come on that because I think depending on the film, the music will adjust to that. And I think music is always changing. And the fact that the Oscars have an award for the best score is telling that music is very important to film. Um, I don't think it's changing, though. Uh, I think it's not really going to change much. Uh, I think it will maybe change for independent films because independent films might be making their own scores for their own films. Yeah, yeah. Because the way the music industry works and the way sort of uh, contractual agreements work and how music 
uh, what, how music artists have to go through their publishers and like to, it's just it's a ridiculous process and um, and even the music industry is changing now because people would rather get their music on commercials or on films because you make much more money from that than you yeah. do from Spotify so actually you have artists who want to get their film their music on films but it's so expensive um, I can't remember what the word for it I, I should actually I should text my publisher after this and see what he yeah. says because I forget what it's called but um, when you want to try and get your music on there it's just really expensive so maybe independent filmmakers will be making their own music so hiring sort of college kids to like make right. new music etc yeah because I mean like John Williams is I don't know 85 years old like he's not doing scores to movies much anymore mm. the one guy who I thought is fantastic uh, as far as you know doing scores for movies was uh, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the band. This is like more my generation than yours. Nine Inch Nails. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. Trent Reznor. Hmm. You know he he put out uh, the one movie that sticks directly out of my mind uh, was Gone Girl. Okay. Uh, very moody, uh, but that's like that's a style from it's, like yeah. even Nine Inch Nails. And he, I think that he might he might be the new John Williams for all I know. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I honestly, I, I don't know where it's going to go, but I think independent film studios will just use, make their own music for it, I think, instead. And I met I met a lot of these people who make scores for films, and it is so expensive. It's so expensive. If you're, if you're trying to get... See, so for you, you have to pay for studio time, you have to pay the artist. Yeah, yep. and usually if you want to get more like classical music going, I mean, you need to pay for the orchestra. So you're looking yeah. at like, if you want to score for a film, you're looking at like anywhere from like twenty five to $100,000 for a basic film school. Wow. If you're looking for a big film, then you look yeah. into the millions. Um, so I, I don't know how much, um, oh my God, I forget his name. He did like the the, the score for um, Interstellar. He does all of Nolan, mm. a lot of Nolan score. What's his name? <sighs> Let's look it up. We don't have Jamie from uh, Joe yeah, Rogan, but, uh, but, um, let's but see. I think he got paid like 1.2 million. For like, so it's like, it's a big budget to make film for, uh, music for film. Um, Let's see. For Inter, Who and he did, did Parts of the Caribbean as well. He did all of... Hans, Hans Zimmer. Zimmer. Yeah, so this oh, guy but he's been around for ages. ages he's been yeah. around, I think, since at least the eighties. Yeah, but I mean, like to make those kind of scores, it's worth. I think he did the score to like ET, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know. I can't. Yeah, <laughs> I can't yeah, yeah. But, um, or but maybe, yeah. maybe or maybe that was John Williams. I don't remember. Mm. No, but music does play a big big part. In film. Yeah, but I don't know where it will go. Yeah. How do you how do you see your own music evolve? My music evolve. Yeah. Oh, right. As an artist it evolves constantly. I think you make a song and then two months later you're like, Oh, this is shit. I should be making better. And you constantly make better and better and better music as long as you keep going at it. It's like the ten thousand hour rule. Right. You know, the more hours you put in, the better the music you make, and also the quicker the music you make. I think yeah. like if I go back five years ago to when I was making music, you know, back then I think I could write a song within like 20 minutes, half an hour. Now I can write a song in like three, like literally in one go. And then I'll just adapt the lyrics or like, you know, maybe it'll take me a bit longer, maybe 20 minutes. But like yeah. for me, a long song will take me maybe an hour. That's like a really long time for a song. And that's something that I'm really trying to develop. So my music taste changes as well in what I'm writing. Uh, it constantly develops. But so this album that I'm releasing now is, uh, is really interesting. And funnily enough, I, I re-listened to it recently and I can't stand it anymore. I think it's so bad <laughs> compared to what I'm making now. I think it's terrible. Um, but I'm still going to have to market it. and like. Yeah. Sure, yeah. But, so but, tell me more about that. When is it releasing? Any details? Yeah, so we decided as a team to release it. A new song every six to eight weeks. That's the plan for now. Just and you're releasing these on which platform? All platforms. All platforms. They'll be anywhere. Spotify. No you could listen to some random Indian platform that I don't know about. It will be okay. on there, so don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll be able to find it. Um and uh, yeah, so release it every six or eight weeks and it'll be everywhere. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it. Um, so yeah, it's going to be six songs and maybe seven, but for now it's confirmed six. And since we're releasing them every six to eight weeks, that's how it's going to go. But yeah, that's the plan. And then you, you mentioned a movie before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can't, obviously I can't say. It sure. Before, yeah. But, but um, yeah, so we're, we have nearly finished the writing for the film. Okay. And uh, and we're probably we're hoping to shoot it in July. Uh, we've already gotten. Uh, I can't say that actually. But yeah, we we we've got film going to be shoot shoot shot soon, uh, and that's going to be sort of it's going to be a dark comedy. Um, 
and I can't say too much on it, but I can say that basically I'll be playing, the film plays on a lot of stereotypes and all these big groups and communities that we know now, um, they're going to play on those stereotypes, 100%. And it's going to make a lot of people angry. It's going to make a lot of people laugh. It's going to make a lot of people upset. But that's the point of it. You're pushing boundaries. Hundred. I mean, I don't think we could push more boundaries. Well, here's this the boundary like, pusher. I mean, this like even Dave Chappelle, I think would be like, "Yo, you need to calm down." <laughs> thing. Like, this one really pushes boundaries, but it's meant. But to who be knows? Like, maybe you might be the next Dave Chappelle. May, nah, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> right. But, um, but the the plan for this film was if we, it's not an attack, but if we sort of make jokes and make comedy jokes on every single community, people will realize that we're not attacking one. It's like it's meant right. to be common on the whole society. Right. And then I've also got this documentary that should be being filmed around June or July and hopefully will come out by the end of 2024, maybe early 2025. Um, get put in the film festivals and hopefully raise enough money. So when it comes out, stay tuned for it. And uh, any money you can donate, 100% donate. It'll be quite easy. But if you don't, don't worry. It's meant to be just cinema. We're Do not you have a website for this? Um, or a place where people can donate? Uh, yeah, so if you want to donate to the charity, you can. It's called uh, Volunteers Foundation, I think. Okay, I'll have that on a, in the yeah, link below. Yeah, we'll put uh, it in below. the link. Uh, but, if you want to, but that's the charity that I was working with, and we're doing... Um, they basically don't have enough money, so they're going to soon close down. They bring kids uh, education to kids in Kibera, which is like the biggest slum in Africa, based in Kenya. And uh, I've been there, I've worked with them, I've helped them with administration. I can actually say every penny goes, but... That's regardless. I'm not trying to promote them. That's sure, not the yeah. point of this. And that's not the point of the documentary either. It's just to enlighten people, firstly, on what happens in slums in an accessible way. And secondly, it's also just to have a fantastic story. Just to immerse yeah. people. And then if you like the story and you like what you see and you want to actually have a call to action and you want to donate or actually go further in, be my guest. This is actually not just to donate money to the charity but also to get people to maybe create their own charities and like see that there are problems in the world. It's just a call to action. Sure. It's not a plea for help. That's the last thing we wanted to do. So, um, so yeah, so that's the film and right. that's kind of it. All right. Well, where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram. Uh, What's your... My Instagram. So I can put it in the link if you want, but yeah. it's Alex Arno 2003 Arno is a French surname, so it's A-I-N-A-U-D. Um, you can find me on TikTok, but I'm not posting there, but I soon will be. Uh, and, and you you have a I can link all this yeah, below it, we'll, we'll link it all in the description so Instagram TikTok Spotify as well it's the same thing it's Alexano and uh, and yeah I've got one song on there from like years ago from when I was younger just for fun so don't listen to that or sure. do if you want but yeah, yeah. that's where the music will be coming but out but your, your new your new album should be out on Spotify it will be out on Spotify on that profile and uh, I think soon I think my the production company that we're setting up should be set up fully within a month so maybe I'll give you the link to that as well. For sure. Goes yeah. Out. But yeah, and so all the films should be on there as well. So if ever you want to check them out, everything will be marketed on Instagram and there we go. So, Perfect. So everything should be there. So if you want, check it out, but you don't have to. Um, I just enjoyed the conversation today. And Absolutely. Kind of yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. You know, you're, you are a, the, the number one friend of off the cover. <laughs> uh, you've been there since the beginning. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that you actually helped me come up with the name for the channel. I did. I did. Yeah. yeah. I very much I was, did. Like, I was I did. bouncing around ideas and I'm like, okay, off the cover, you know, we want to yeah. go beyond, mm. you know, the, 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 the movie poster yeah. uh, and dive deeper, which, uh, hopefully I've been doing. Yeah. But, uh, but honestly, it's been a pleasure being on here. Honestly, absolutely. It has been it. a very, very big pleasure. I hope uh, I was articulate. I'm a bit tired. Yeah, and everything, absolutely. But. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, every time you got to just yeah. wrap, wrap it up, but, uh, uh, thank you for joining me. Yeah, and I, hopefully I can come back another time. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, thank you so much. All right, thank you. absolutely. All right. Lovely. Well, yeah. cool. Yeah. This Have a fun. good one.